Welcome to Training Magazine's 21st Annual Conference and Expo held in Atlanta. This is session number 415. The title of the presentation is Lean Instructional Systems Development, Lean ISD. This presentation was recorded live and unedited. Thank you. An MIT study that came out in the mid-90s about the global automotive industry. And uh, being MIT folks, they were interested in uh, how do we salvage our American automotive industry. I don't know if you remember this, but back in the early 70s, it, the automotive industry in this country accounted for one out of five jobs. <clears throat> one out of five jobs in the early 70s were, were all related to our automotive industry. Lean uses the best of both mass and craft production, according to the machine that changed the world. Other attributes of this, uh, principles and attributes, included teamwork, the use of teams. Okay, the quality movement has brought the whole teaming concept to the forefront here. We all kind of understand that. We should understand where it works well, where it doesn't work well. There's different types of teams, and there's stages of team development, and it's not an easy thing to embrace and put in place, and after day two, you're off and running. It doesn't work that way. There's also a need for a tremendous amount of communication, formal communication, up and down, lateral communications, and vehicles for informal communication. The whole concept of lean involves the efficient use of resources and the elimination of waste. Wasted steps, waste in the whole process, wasted time. But because you embrace this at the very beginning and you understand lessons learned from the quality movement, there's continuous improvement because you never get it right, and continuous improvement is just the start of the journey that never ends. Okay, All the things that the quality movement has taught many of us. Lean, uh, also, a process or methodology for lean would have defined processes and steps. We would know where we are in the process. Are we at the beginning? Are we at the middle? Are we at the end? Where the heck are we? A lot of process models now may break down things into phases of process. So might have a new product development process or a manufacturing process where people can understand where is the product, where are we in all of this. It's like understanding we're in the seventh inning, we're in the, at the bottom of the first, we're going to sing the song right away. It's a framework. The number of pitches thrown to that point here varies from game to game, but we know what the seventh inning is. If somebody asks you what the score is and it's 28 to 2, if it's in the first inning, there's still a chance for the team that's only got two. It's the bottom of the ninth and two outs. <clears throat> may not happen for them. Now we know. Within the processes uh, defined, there's defined roles and responsibilities. Who's supposed to do what? What is the design engineer supposed to do? What's the manufacturing engineer supposed to do? Or what's the training designer supposed to do? And what's the developer supposed to do? Is there clarity in, in the roles? Or have we kind of confused it because we don't have jobs anymore, we just got roles, so no one really is quite clear in terms of what they're supposed to do. The use of standard tools and templates, we're going to be talking about some of the types of templates and tools that you can use. We're not going to show you our examples of those things. Our, our goal here is not to pitch for you to buy ours. It's for you to embrace this concept and maybe build your own. And if you've been doing ISD and you've got ISD people doing these kinds of things, they can be brought together to create their own standard tools and templates. Uh, the more alike they are in their concepts and philosophies about ISD, the easier that will be. The more unlike they are, the harder that will be. It will be a hill to climb. All of this requires a bunch of flexibility because one size does not fit all. So even if you have a standard process model on how to do something, how to build something, whether it's training or not, and you defined all the roles and responsibilities, and you put in a bunch of templates and tools, if you're going to embrace the best of mass production and craft production, you're going to have to allow for some flexibility here. Because not everything, every approach is going to be situationally the same. So your client's needs are going to differ. You're going to have to be able to flex it. ISD, instructional systems design or development, depending on what reference you cite. Uh, there's more, less passive learning with good ISD models. It's less spray and pray. There's more assessment or testing of whether or not people are learning what they're supposed to be learning before we move on to the next step, whether we're doing 
traditional group instructor-led kinds of approaches or non-traditional web-based or CBT kinds of things with interactivity built in and assessment built in so the learner knows whether to proceed or whether to back up and do some remedial stuff. There's, uh, the more effective the instructional process is due to the fact that we've articulated the terminal objectives and maybe enabling objectives and derive what the content should be because of that. I'm not sure how familiar you all are with ISD. <clears throat> There's a focus on job performance and learning how to do something versus just content, chunks of content in that. Unless, of course, a chunk of content is relative, uh, relevant to the performance that we're trying to affect. Better use of instructional media. Um, we know that we can learn the principles of facilitation, presentation, negotiation out of a book but you don't learn the skill. You don't hone the skill by reading a book, whether that book is presented electronically over your intranet or not. Um, common complaints from our customer side, we've heard the supply side, and the, uh, we have customers for our ISD stuff. It takes too long. We get trapped in analysis paralysis. We don't seem to be able to come out. 60, 90 days after we start, we tell the client, this is what we found, and they say, that's what we told you on day one, what gives? Where's the value add in that? Quit doing analysis, you'll never do analysis for me again. It's impossible to forecast and manage when we don't have a common process in place. We can't predict it, we can't make it visible, we can't say what day will we be done, what day will we pilot, nine months or six months or three months hence. And our, that causes our clients some confusion. In the automotive world, they are trying to get their cycle time for, cycle time for new product development down to 36 months from 54 or wherever they're starting from. And then the goal is to get it down to 12 months. It, it's just taking too long and they need to make it more visible and predictable so management can understand where the heck are we in all of this? We're spending the shareholders equity on all of this. Where are we? What's the score? The variable results depends on the designer and each of us have our own approach to ISD and that causes problems. Each designer uses his or her own process formats, defaults, everything, and we lose control. You cannot have a bunch of designers in the manufacturing world just doing design any old way that they want to with their personal preferences at the forefront. That does not work. They can't integrate. Bottom line, it's, it's difficult to get consistent, reliable results from ISD unless you've got some process put in place. And of course, you can put a fat process in place also, not the goal. Being applied to ISD would have benefits on the quality, the cycle time, and the costs. All the things that the quality movement has been teaching us. We have our own process model for ISD, for lean ISD. We call it the PAC processes. Be that it's made. What it's got is it's got three levels of design. The highest level of design, the systems engineering level of design for a curriculum is what we call curriculum architecture design. It's akin to the automotive industry designing a car from top down. What's going to be in it? Rather than saying, here's the wiring harness and here's the spark plug and build around it and all of a sudden, voila, you got a car, they're coming at it from top down. It's going to be convertible, two door, four door, what? Five door? The next level down is a more traditional approach to ISD, and this is our model that's akin to an ADDI model, which we'll get to in a few moments. Modular curriculum development, and again, we're building modules of training so that we can increase the future shareability and reduce future life cycle costs. Those of us in the training business are in a product business. We have markets and customers and stakeholders and our own internal stuff on the supply side of the equation. This allows us to reduce the cost for us being in business to produce an entire product line. So we're trying to reduce first cost and overall life cycle costs, which are very expensive to our uh, shareholders that pay the freight and derive the benefits or the not benefits. And then we have something at, the, at a lower level, instructional activity development, whether we're creating a demonstration or a test, so you can approach just building some tests without building the whole courses or building an entire curriculum architecture 
we can support whatever our client's immediate needs are and start at the bottom level or at the top level, depending on what their needs are, what's driving them. We can have some very flexible approaches to this. We can go build simulation exercises for them so they can put them and take them to the uh, sales uh, conference and run some simulations without all the courses and later back up and build the courses all around those elements and maybe even back into an entire curriculum architecture for their domain. We have a packed analysis methodology on the front end that uh, drives all of this at three levels. We can do macro analysis to support curriculum architecture. We can do a mid-level analysis in terms of the details that we're getting to do the modular curriculum development. And we can do micro analysis, keystroke level kinds of things if we're going to build instructional activities of uh, various types. And then most important to getting control over ISD, control's got a bad connotation, unless you're management worried about the shareholders' equity and what you're doing with it, then you want to be in control of this. Just like if you're building a new house, you kind of want to be in control of what the carpenters are doing. You're not just empowering them to build any old house that they feel a, a desire to that morning when they arrive on the job site. Oh, no. So you got to have a way to plan these projects and make it visible and predictable to your clients so they understand what, what are my costs going to be, when will this be done, what will I have when it's done, and then you can manage to that. So that you know it's 28 to 2. First inning or ninth? Because it's different. Makes you feel eh, less worried. 28 to 2 is something to worry about. But if it's the first inning, eh. and if it's Pee Wee Baseball here, hey, anything can happen. But in the seventh inning or whenever they cut off Pee Wee Baseball. <coughs> so these are our three levels of ISD. Yes, we need Good morning. Okay, I'm going to do a uh, kind of a pause here, but we've got this this love the three level model. You've got a systems level, you've this macro, you've got the individual you know course level that's the the mid, and then you've got the micro for the activities. I don't know if any of you have tried to explain ISD to your clients. Just one level is enough; they don't even want to hear about that. Um, but unfortunately, to, to get this lean thing to work, you really do need the multiple levels. That top level, usually the one that's missing, is mapping out the curriculum. If you don't have the top level, you're less likely to find shareable components that work in multiple end products. You're starting, and you're going to optimize the mid-sized piece, and it won't fit into the, the overall scheme. So you, have the, you really need to be able to convince your customers this is a good way to go. And it's not as hard as it might seem if you can compare it to what they do. So if you've got an auto manufacturer, there's just a couple examples to help you think about these things. If you're uh, working with a car company, you can say, you know, just like you get systems engineer the whole car, and then you've got teams that work on the individual systems, like the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, and you've got other design happening down at the micro level on the back seat fan control switch. They all have customer requirements and supplier capabilities. They all are doing trade-offs, but they all have to integrate up into the total car. And if you're really smart, you have platforms that integrate across vehicles so that you maybe use the same chassis in a bunch of vehicles, but you maybe vary the outside body or the some of the trim. There's a telecommunications example. You've got a phone system with switches and, and uh, wiring. That all has to fit together. You've got components within that that all have to integrate into the whole. They all have to be designed individually. Software could work. You've got the whole financial uh, integrated financial number crunching system and down inside there you have spreadsheet functionality and down inside that you've got cut and paste function. Cut and paste should probably work pretty similarly even to word processing. So you don't let that designer optimize cut and paste and do a unique thing there because no one will know how to use it. It's better for the overall whole. Sorry, I'm pointing at this. The overall whole at the top, if you have used that same cut and paste functionality all over, it's easier for the user, it's easier to maintain it later. So that's, that's kind of the thing we're going for. And the idea here is think about your business. What would the three levels be or the four levels or the two levels you could use to say, hey, we need to design at the macro before we go looking at the piece part. So what I was going to ask for a little interactivity, does anybody here have an idea for your own business you'd like to share or can't come up with that? Doesn't The model doesn't work for your business. So 
So you probably run into situations where maybe one group would want it tailored a certain way, but it's better for you to cut it up and have something that's more shareable. What what line of business is it? What kind of company? Okay. So I don't know enough about that to give you an analogy. But <laughs> <laughs> I bet there's somebody who plans out, here's all the kinds of mortgages we can offer, um, then maybe... Okay. So individually, somebody's probably looking at each pricing option and calculating the, you know, is that worth doing that way? Whereas somebody is looking more macro, like we're going to do mortgages like this, you know, adjustable versus non-adjustable, I don't know. but So you can convince them, yeah, see, we're just doing the same thing in training you folks do when hooking up our service line. So it makes sense. You might not do the pricing ideally for one mortgage because you've got to make the whole product line make sense. Cool. Anybody else? Okay. So you have to change the sheet metal on this on your coaching thing, just like you do in the truck business. Oh sure. <laughs> yep. But so, yeah, excellent. <laughs> this is an interesting thing, and uh, we're going to get to it in a little bit. We talk about plug and play versus clone and tweak. You know, and, and how much of that shareability do you make visible to the customer, and how much of it is just in your own operation? So you can have lean training products, and you can have a lean training operation, and they don't necessarily have to know that's a shared coaching module. They didn't see you make that swap. Yeah, or you build a shareable piece and a tailored piece. I'll move forward here. So that's, that's the idea. You've got these three levels, and this, this will look a little bit at the macro level. And I think this is really where you get a, most of the leverage for some of these economies. When you're designing the overall system, if you can see enough of a, a horizon to know, there are going to be these other audiences, there are going to be these other kind of content areas and projects we're going to have to address. Can we build some modular products so that we build product X? It could be a training uh, CBT thing. It could be a classroom course, product Y. We've got the equivalent space here to make eight chunks. The idea is if you share two of those chunks, you only really have to build six of them. You only have to maintain six of them. If something changes, there's six places to go make fixes, not eight. But this is the thing about plug and play. You may be able to just lift this, you may be able to lift that upper left and put it into Y. If it's something like Excel spreadsheets, and the thing on the right of it is the application exercise to do a budget in X, and then Y is maybe how to do a bunch of pricing what ifs. Same spreadsheet operation, but it may not be that simple. Maybe the coaching module where you've got the similar, but not quite exactly the same. You still have some opportunities to gain some efficiencies by, okay, so we shared it and we replaced the word um, purchasing with uh, finance. It's still a lot faster than building too. If you have those training development organizations separated geographically, you need to be able to have the master design so they know. If somebody over there is working on that coaching module. I'm not going to invent my own. I'm going to go try and borrow theirs and make use of it. So this CAD level, the curriculum architecture level, is very key mapping top down that you can find the opportunity to share. You know, we're going to make 12 kinds of trucks, four utility, a four-door one, a two-door one. So let's make the chassis that'll fit all of them. If we don't know that, we can't take advantage of that. The uh, <clears throat> mid-level design then uh, for both the analysis and the design side of our little model here uh, is akin to the ADDIE model, also known as the big block diagram, came out of uh, World War II efforts. The military was interested in making sure they were both trained in a similar fashion, learned the same kinds of things, gained control of that. <clears throat> The country was at stake. This is the ADDIE model, Analysis, Design, Development, Implementation, Evaluation. So we've kind of embraced this and made some changes in the way we look at our own models on this. <clears throat> we'll come back to a little bit of that more. The micro level then is development of some typical instructional elements. Could be things such as a simulation exercise that you could just build without having, you could use this simulation exercise as an in-basket exercise in the selection process without having the training. 
and maybe later on someday you'll build a training around it. It depends on your customer's need. Performance tests, the pre-test, post-test, maybe that test is used in the selection process also and not after we've hired them. We'll see what they know and they can avoid certain training or we'll test them at the end of it to measure what learning really did occur. Structured on-the-job training, uh, demonstrations, case studies, etc. Performance or job aids can be built this way. You don't have to build the whole course. You might just create the job aid as a shortcut to getting something to happen and build a course later on around it. So your customers are going to have different needs. You're going to have to situationally appraise what, there's, what those needs are. What do you have to do? How much of a hurry are we in? Can we take a little bit more time? Or no, we can't. It's not appropriate. Driving this whole thing is a packed analysis process that feeds at the macro, mid-level, and micro level. Just like designers in your manufacturing or whoever's creating your products and services can do analysis of the needs at various levels appropriate to what the heck are they going to go design. The whole set of financial instruments or mortgages that we're going to have at a very high level and just spec those out so we can decide which ones make business sense or we can actually build the things and deploy them and get them happening right away. Our four types of ISD analysis that we use are include a target audience data. Any marketeer is going to understand, well, who's the customer for this training product? What, who are the primary customers? Who are the secondary customers? And are there tertiary customers? People who may show up and attend our courses, but hey, we weren't trying to meet their needs anyway. Let's get some clarity about who it is we're trying to ch meet the needs of and how many of them are there and where are they. Are there 3,000 people in one building on one campus or are there 3,000 people strewn about the globe in onesies and twosies? Makes a big difference here in terms of my design of the product and deploying it. Because I have to have a distribution channel of my product to the customer. Either I bring the customer to my product or I send my products out to the customers. And I may do a little bit of both both in my overall product line design concept. So I gotta figure that out. Who are they, where are they? And talk with my customers to make sure that I'm clear that they have a chance to correct me when I'm wrong about how many of them are there. Is that number growing or shrinking? Is it just shifting and moving from America to a global operations? Our second type of analysis is modeling the performance. Understanding the ideal performance if we were to take the best in class performers, the master performers in our language, what are they doing? How are they doing it? And then if we were to do a gap analysis, we're trying to understand, so where are the other incumbents that aren't master performers? Where are they? What are they struggling with? What are their problems? Those two types of analysis of the performance situation may be appropriate or not appropriate to your project. Again, as always, it depends. So you need to figure out, they're on the payroll to do what? They're on the payroll to perform. Okay, then once we understand with clarity what the outputs and tasks are and the roles and responsibilities, and where the typical gaps in performance are, and what some of the causes might be, knowledge deficiencies, environmental support deficiencies, or inter individual attributes. Some people need to be thinking conceptually, some people need to think concretely, or some jobs require both. Well, good luck in finding them. Um, or they may have to have a physical stamina to do a 28-hour negotiating thing. You just can't wimp out after a couple hours here. The job requires you to have some more stamina than that. So you can understand what are some of these enablers. We can look at what are the knowledge and skill enablers. We can systematically derive each knowledge and skill by various categories. We can look at what are the laws, regulations, and codes that people need to be compliant with. What are the company policies and procedures? What are tools and equipment? What are those interpersonal skills or personal development skills? What are things unique to management and supervisors that you got to have? What do they need to know about the marketplace or our processes or our customers or our products and services? So we can systematically tease this out once we understand what are they doing? What are they performing? And to perform at a level of mastery, what do you got to know or be able to do at a skill level? Then we always look at existing training and development that, that the shareholders of our corporations have already invested in. Can we salvage any of that and use it as is, or just take it apart and modify it and steal from it, or never use it again, throw it away, get it off the books? We don't go shopping to salvage existing training until we understand with clarity what the heck we're looking for in the first place. Then, 
another portion of our approach to lean ISD that you'll need if you're going to embrace this concept is to get a handle on the project planning and management aspects and have a structured process. So when does analysis end and when does design, design begin and when does development begin? Do you know? Is it clear? Are those lines of demarcation, which are somewhat arbitrary at times, are they pinned down? Do people know when they cross the line into from analysis to design? The predefined roles and responsibilities. So what does an analyst do versus the designer versus the developer and maybe of a project manager? Or maybe those are just roles that one person, one individual plays all of those and they're shifting hats that they wear as they take something through the process. You might have a need for generalists, you might have a need for specialists, you may have a need for both types of people. We got an analyst over here, they just do analysis for a living. We got a designer over here, they do creative design stuff. Analysts aren't creative types, they recognize patterns. Designers make patterns. They think out of the box. Analysts don't. They just try to pin down what it is we're trying to build. Maybe you need people that can do both things and, and, and also develop and deliver. So you've got to figure out what are the roles and responsibilities. If you can't do detailed planning, then I don't think you can be successful in ISD projects. You've got to be make your, your efforts more predictable to your customers in terms of when we're going to get done, how much is it going to cost when the dust settles, what are we going to have when we're done with all of this. And then you've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to work on perhaps simultaneously, concurrently, different projects, different ISD development projects. Um, depending on how you organize and staff, you're going to have a greater need for detailed planning or less of a need. You're going to have one person take a project from cradle to grave and they're not usable on any other projects until they're done with that. If that's how you're going to manage it, then you have less of a need for detailed planning. But if you're going to use specialist analysts who get really good at this or designers who get really good at aspects of design, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to move them from job site to job site. It's like moving cranes and bulldozers and graders and have them all do the right thing at the right time, but you've got limited assets and you're moving around. And detailed planning will, will make that happen. And then you have to have continuous communications. You've got to create formal mechanisms and readouts and reviews for managers and laterally across the project. And as the baton is handed off from the analyst designer, it's more than just handing off a baton and letting them run off into the distance to the goal line. <coughs> Customer control of content. We always tell our customers that uh, they own all content decisions. We own all process. We own the process, they own the content. We will maintain the instructional integrity because we'll control the ISD process. Every last content decision is theirs. They live with the consequences of it. They paid for it in the first place. It's theirs. We're just working for them. And if they don't believe us in our ISD philosophies and precepts and concepts, then that's their choice. They live with the consequences of that. They've got to make the business decisions inherent in ISD. We make the instructional decisions in ISD. Tools and templates are important. We need to systematically engage the customers and the stakeholders that we serve on the customer side of the equation. We're the supply side. We've got to get the right people doing the right things at the right time. We can produce interview guides at different stages of the whole process so that we're constantly in communication and understanding what the marketplace, what the customers are looking for, what the learners are looking for. Sometimes those customers are the executives who are spending the big bucks on training, and the learners have to take this and run with it. We have project planning templates for the three different levels so that somebody can take an electronic file with a bunch of Word documents in them and PowerPoint presentation things and Excel spreadsheets and a detailed plan, and they start from there. They take their, from the interview notes that they have, from their customer and understanding what the customer wanted, they can go in there and modify this project plan. It's very detailed. If you're going to describe our CAD thing or your equivalent of it, those words don't need to be changed from project to project. But the name of the project is going to have to be changed, and your client here has to be changed, and their background and rationale as to why we're doing this in the first place, that's going to be unique to each project. But if you're in phase two of your project, that should be pretty much the same name, phase two, each and every project that you do. No one has to reinvent that from ground zero. They can take and edit a tool, a template, a word processing kind of a document. The power is out there now with all this, these tools. And we use 
gate review meetings, just like they do in our customer's world. Most of our customers are not just manufacturing folks, but they have places where management comes together and takes a look at what the heck, are, where are we now? How are we doing with cost schedules? What are the issues? What are the decisions? What are the trade-offs that have to be made? The same kind of thing is true in, in training and development projects where we're developing instruction. It's just another product that we can engineer our ISD products, our training and development products, and embrace all the things that our customers most likely are using. A gate review is where we say well, we've got a design. Before you start developing your training, let's review the design and make sure it's okay. And let's get the people who are going to maybe deliver the training, the instructors, maybe they're going to look at it, or the people who are going to build the web the, the materials to be deployed over the web, they're going to look at the design and say, hey, this design stinks. Well, some of it's pretty good, but this element here stinks. If you fix this, I can save a whole bunch of money downstream. Good to know. You mean if I just change my design like this? That everybody's happy now? All the downstream players have got to live with this? Cool. All right, I just saved a fortune, maybe. If you do that a lot, you'll make less mistakes downstream. You bring the downstream players up early in the process. In our model, we bring gate reviews to look at the project plan as the approach, what the consumption is going to be of resources, the schedule, the dollars, and all those kinds of things, and get, some, get our customer group, a project steering team, to sanction the project plan. Then we go do analysis, and we have an analysis report. They, they approve the analysis data so that we're building a design based on good analysis data. And then they approve the design before we build it. Then we go build it, and we pilot test it, and we bring back the results, and we say, here's our revision recommendations. You will turn them into revision specifications, and that's what we'll do. So we're giving control to our customers who always wanted to be in control in the first place because we're working for them, and we some often lose sight of that. It's kind of interesting. I, I had the uh, two jobs ago, I had the good fortune to work on five new product development teams. Then uh, I joined SWI, and I worked with at t Network Systems, and they were um, doing a lot of training for their product managers. So they were looking at product development processes. So I've seen a lot of these mapped out in different clients to... Uh, General Dynamics, um, Digital Equipment, a number of these companies, they all, as a consultant, you sign the non-disclosure, so you can't tell them that their model looks just like the last one, but at some level, it's pretty much the same thing. It's not even unlike our uh, course development model. There's always some concept phase, and there's always a little more detail, and there's tryout, and that's how different can it really be. The one uh, thing that you see a lot of in all these processes, they were called stage gate kind of processes, and the guy's describing the gate idea. And that's kind of, you have the stage of activity, it may be big, it may be little, you may do lots of steps, you may just take a shortcut, but the gates never change. The management team still looks at those, those gates and you're not supposed to move forward unless you get approval to move forward. So we've kind of built in our process to make this, it sounds like it's more formal, and it's anti-lean in that sense, but actually it is pro-lean because you've got, you, you don't go downstream and start to build unless you really have approval to go. And so at this project planning point here, that's where you're looking at the total resource implications. You're looking at, you know, is this problem we're solving, is this one we should be working on, is this the right level of resources? If not, stop us now. If so, then we go and do analysis and we come back, we have more information. That should we proceed given this type of performance, these knowledge and skills, and kind of looking like this type of design, going to the design level, now we've mapped out a whole bunch of training, all the training that could be at the CAD level. Here it is, you know, does this look right? Does this fit? Does this cover everything? Yes, no. If so, then implementation planning is simply saying, let's prioritize that, let's put some costs against it, and if we had all the training that could be in the design phase, now we're going to figure out what we should build first. Some of it we might never build because it's just there's no return for it. In the MCD process, same thing. We, we cut a gate out, really, and our, most of the time we don't have a gate after phase four. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same idea. But that gate at phase four, which is typically, let's go over every slide and wordsmith it, we believe you spend a bunch of time in there. You undo a lot of the work done in the development phase, and there's very little payback. So we cut that one out. We typically do your developmental reviews, do your SME checks, 
get the content right, but you empower the developers and the team to do that, <coughs> do the pilot test, get data from that, and then get that reviewed at the end of phase five and say, okay, we got this feedback, here's what we believe we should change. Let we'll the steering team say yay or nay, and then move forward. Sometimes the activities are really designed inside of the course development process. This would be if you were building a simulation or selection or, you know, as a for some other purpose, then you could follow the same exact process essentially as the uh, course development one. So we've got these phases. They're they're there, they're recognizable activities happening with side. Do we always do all the gates? No, sometimes we combine. Isn't that cool? I didn't program this, I think this is really neat. It's the first computer presentation I've ever done. I'm just surprised it worked this far. But you can combine analysis and design. You can take uh, um, what you're doing is just cutting out a gate. We're going to go ahead and do our analysis. We're going to go ahead and do our design. And then we're going to review that. Now, the, the, the benefits are obviously faster. Sometimes the bottlenecks in these processes getting that steering team to get together to do the gate review. And it's the same thing in the product development process. They always want to go just work ahead and we'll approve it. You have to really hold the line and say, no, we've got to get this checked. If they don't, there's some risks that you're going to go through design. Now you've invested more in it before you had a check. You may end up having rework. So you've got to inform them, and you have to be pretty sure yourself that those kinds of uh, things aren't going to trash your project. So this is the same idea you can combine. You can go through, get design, get approval on what you're going to go build, and then just go build the whole thing and not, not know until you're done. If it's, if it's okay, if it's... They did this a lot in the in manufacturing where they would go all the way to prototype cut metal before they knew this was going to be good or not. Now with the computers they can do a lot more virtually, get customers looking at things before they've actually invested in the real expensive stuff. The other part of this is that once you're making these gate reviews and you have role clarity these are our typical teams here. Again, it can vary all over the place, but a project steering team, they own the project. We're working for them. They say, we don't like your stuff, throw it away, work it all over again. That's what we do. So the whole idea here is to get through these gates, get through these processes as quickly as possible and avoid rework because rework takes more time and more cost. And if you do it right the first time, that's the goal. So we get pushback from clients to say, we've got to have all these gate reviews that slows us down. Uh, yeah, but we don't have all that rework here, so we save actually time and cost. And if they're from the manufacturing world, if they've ever lived through that and done some of the things right and front end loaded their processes and taken a little bit more time up front and went slow to go fast, if they've actually learned that in other parts of the organization that you serve, then you can draw an analogy to the same thing here. Because we built a lot of training in the past that turned out to be garbage and we had to rework it lots of times. Because we never did any of the front end steps correctly. We didn't have clarity about who we were trying to train in the first place or what the performance was. So we built training, because kind of kludging it together, and then we're back to a rework city and it's costly. And the shareholders wouldn't be well served. We, so we define, these are our teams that come from the customer side. So we organize all the customers, all the customers and stakeholders, anybody that could come out of the woodwork during the course of our project and take exception to what we're doing, we want them involved since day one. Let them argue it out about what we should be doing, who sh we should be doing it for. I don't want to make those decisions as an ISD person because I can never win. Why would I even want to have the decision? Let them decide. We'll pull together a bunch of analysis team members, master performers, sometimes we call them subject matter experts, and they did the job 12 years ago, and now they're a vice president or a high muckety-muck, and they don't know what the real world job is today. So we like to bring in subject matter experts who may understand the future state a little bit and where we're trying to go to, but we typically want master performers, and we want to benchmark them, and that's how you sell it. We want your absolutely best people to be involved on our analysis team, and we're going to teach everybody to be just like them. Sound like a good idea? That's what benchmarking is all about. So you sell it that way. Then we take a subset of the analysis team and make them the design team so that we have continuity as we go into the design. As we take all the analysis data and work it into our design, sometimes that analysis data is quite complex. 
and how it was all gathered. You had to have been there to understand it when it's done. So that's what we need on the design team. And if we bring in a new design team member, we have to brief them and orient them to all this data and it slows the whole thing down. So we tell the project steering team way back in the very first phase, this is the deal. If you introduce new players here, all bets are off in terms of the schedule and the costs. Sorry, the world just works that way. So if we make the right decisions, get the right people involved and understand the implications for the burden on them, they're more likely to let us do this. And in a CAD project, we're at this architectural level here, so we're trying to identify all the training that could be and then prioritize what should be, so we pull together an implementation planning team with a lot of management spies on there so that they make decisions that management will like. See, we're, we're, we're trying to get out of the business of making all the decisions that management won't like. We organize them so that they'll make the decision, hey, this is the job, that's so the analysis team says, so your best people said, this is the job, no kidding. And these are the knowledge and skills that are required to do that job, no kidding. Not training people saying that, master performers from their real world. People that the project steering team handpicked to be on the analysis team so that they would believe them. Build the quality in, don't inspect it in later. And one of the ways to do that is to have the project steering team handpick the analysis team members, sanction the subset of them to be the design team members, and populate the implementation planning team with people that they trust. Just because we're skilled at uncovering training needs does not warrant meeting them and we can build fancy ROI equations to prove which training is the best investment, but they know intuitively, they know in their guts what they're gonna get for this chunk of training versus that chunk of training, they know. So why do we play all these games and try to prove to them what they already inherently know? Why don't we just organize them to make those decisions for us and we'll get on with it? That's our goal. When we do the MCD, which is build a course or two, bundle three or four courses together if it makes sense, and go build them. The same concept, project steering team, handpicks the analysis team, subset is the design team. Then we identify the subject matter experts and master performers that we're going to work with on the development of the product. Who should we be talking to? Let's, I've done reports before where the names on the front cover blew me away. Somebody said, they were involved. Well, this is all garbage. I don't even need to look further, guy. Well, yeah, if I would have had the project steering team handpick who I'm going to be interfacing with and developing materials based on their say-so, they ought to have credibility with the project steering team. Otherwise, why would they want to make the investments? And then pilot test teams, my favorite. They always bring in master performers to sit through, and then the master performers say, didn't learn a darn thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I tell, I want half the seats, whether it's traditional or not, I want learners, target audience representatives. And then I want half the room full of management spies. We call them management representatives, but they're really your spies to go in there. So we can measure learning, and then we can measure whether it was the right thing to learn in the first place. Because the learners wouldn't know, and the master performers won't learn a darn thing, so we can't even measure pre and post, because they are master performers. They can just assess whether it was the right stuff, not whether the training was effective. I didn't learn a darn thing in your course here, but I think it's pretty nice. But I didn't learn a thing. That's the message that goes through the whole damn organization. I hate when that happens. IED, same team, same concept. If you're building simulation exercises or performance tests or performance aids, job aids, the same kind of a structure here. Let your customer have control at the right points. Let them populate the teams, and this is the people that are going to direct us. We just know how to build training. We're not masters of the content. How could we be, unless we came from that world? Well, maybe we can wear both hats. We have a bunch of tools and templates here. You can build these kinds of things yourself. You can build a project plan, a generic, start from here. Don't reinvent the cover page. Why? If every one of your ISD people is inventing project plans here, boy, are you wasting money and time. Proposals or statements of work some of our clients use. Uh, project steering team review presentations. If it's the gate after the analysis phase, the purpose of the meeting is going to be the same just about each and every one of those. The content we're going to review is different, but the purpose of having the meeting and bringing the people together is pretty much the same. Let's create a deck of overhead transparencies or something to help us process through the review. And this could be a standard thing, and we save a whole bunch of time. We've got to take our personal preferences and each and every instructional designer's personal preferences out of this. We cannot allow them to optimize this presentation for their style exactly. It's too expensive. It's like asking the design engineers for Harley-Davidson, 
Yeah, whatever you want to do on the bike here. Uh, don't worry about what the frame that we're, we're thinking you're going to go use. If you build the engine a little bit differently, it doesn't fit the frame. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll make a new frame. Well, you know, we can't afford to be in business that way anymore. We've got to use standard components and make things fit. We've got to take our personal preferences out of this, allow where our personal creativity can play out, but understand we're trying to optimize the whole system, not your one project. We're trying to optimize this for the shareholders, not for your one target audience who's going to be served by this training program. Uh, the uh, invitation and confirmation letters, pretty much the same thing, except for the name that you send them out to and the address and what the date of the meeting is going to be. But all the yada, 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 what we're going to do in this meeting is pretty much the same. Don't reinvent all these wheels each and every time you send out a letter to invite somebody to an analysis team meeting or a review meeting. We've built tools and go-bys. We've got interview guides uh, that you can follow, the project plan proposal kinds of things. Is a, we've actually created spiral-bound example. When you're done with your project plan, it's going to pretty much look like this. And now you can see whether we're looking for pages and pages of narratives and graphics or whether we're looking for three or four bullet points. Give everybody a clue as to what the heck we're, we're looking for here. Uh, in analysis, we've got a target on data sheets. Fill them out. We've got a performance model framework. Here's where the outputs go. Here's where the tasks go. Here's where the roles and responsibilities are articulated. When you, when you go out and gather analysis data, what the heck are people supposed to do with it? What should it look like when they're done documenting it? Well, yeah, sometimes it may have to change a little bit, but we've been using the same performance model. I've been using the same one since 1979. It works in every project I've ever used. The knowledge and skill matrices, how you capture all these various knowledge and skills that are the enablers, and how you organize all this data. You want each and every instructional designer on each and every project making this all up on their own? Because now you can't even put it into a database and share it and streamline your operations. When you assess existing training, where, how do you document that? Well, you can create a form, a template. Uh, presentations again, the analysis report and databases. We build tools and goal buys to support a lot of these things. You can too. You don't have to use ours. Design, same kinds of things. We've got specs and maps. It's just our two things at a very high level. We, we design things at four levels. We've got a, ch a form template that's the spec, the specification, and then we've got a map that makes it very visual because sometimes people get it that way and that's the only way they get it. And we got the presentations and we got other design documents and a design database all ready to go. No one has to reinvent that and create a brand new spreadsheet or database for their project because they're just consuming resources here and the shareholder owns those resources. For development, each one of our clients has a different look and feel for the things that we develop, so we're not standardizing any of that for us, but in your companies, you can do that. What's the background color of overhead transparencies or internet deployed things? What are the highlight colors that you should use? What's the fonts that you should use? Hey, standardize it, create a style guide, get on with it. That's low value stuff here for everybody reinventing. Well, you know, I like orange as the highlight color and he likes red. Get their personal preferences out here. Your shareholders can't afford it. Okay, close to wrap up. And people can benchmark with you. The question of the, the kinds of people that we want on there and what their background experience would be. But the problem with doing that is that you have to assess your project and what it's all about. So one size does not fit all, so it's problematic. But project steering team members are going to be the requester, typically. And you've got to decide, is that person really the key representative of this? They may have wanted the training, but the process owner is someplace else. So there's been times when the requester doesn't become the chairperson of our project steering team. It's really owned by somebody else. They're just the one who's got the ball rolling by, by the, via the request. But project steer, steering team, master performers, before they show up into your analysis effort, whether you're doing a group analysis process or you're doing individual interviews, they've got to be recognized as credible master performers by your customer, the project steering team. And they may decide you need five of them or 12 of them in order to cover the waterfront politically, geographically, business unit segment-wise. A lot of politics in our projects here, and the wiring into the politics of the organization is the, via the project steering team. 
Again, anybody who will come out of the woodwork somewhere along the course of your project and take exception to what you're doing, you have to ask yourself, should I have involved them in, the, in this thing on day one? And the answer is usually yes. Now, they may not have wanted to show up, and they may, you may have to go through this a couple of times and not having it be so ideal before the organization learns that, hey, they can be in control of these things here and get a better product out and understand with greater clarity themselves what they're getting for their money and their people's time. Any other questions? There's an article in Appendices A that goes into some more on this thing here. If you want to uh, try to figure out how to do this yourself and sell your organization on building something like this, if you would like to call us and ask for our clients and benchmark with them, um, General Motors is doing this approach. There's, there's factions within Hewlett Packard, Amico, Eli Lilly, Bandag. Um, done this with a lot of different clients. They've got a lot of different experiences with them. Some of them were not at the state of organizational readiness to do this, and we did it prematurely, and they're not doing it anymore. Yes? Okay. Mm hmm We've actually done some of these this work for NASA over the last 10 years. Um, but NASA, of course, learned how to put a man on the moon uh, dealing with cross-functional teams and cross-organizations here, so they know matrix management like nobody else. That would be a good place to go. Lots of good things in the industry. Thank you. Please fill out your evaluations. Grab any a number of materials and things in the back that you'd like. This presentation is now concluded. To order additional tapes, call toll-free 1-800-338-2111. Thank you.